Hey everyone, welcome back. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the dual formulation of the SVM problem. Now I'll be really honest here, and this is more of a stepping stone video in order for us to get to the real topic we want to talk about, which is SVM kernels. So when I think about topics in machine learning that are very, very useful, but also kind of difficult to grasp, I think kernels lie at the intersection. And I think part of that is that a lot of times people get taught this idea of kernels and SVM without the proper background knowledge. And so I want to avoid that by first giving you all the background, at least at a sort of high to medium level, so that going into the kernels video, you're better set up. But that said, this is not going to be a proof-based video. Although you see a lot of formulas behind me, I'm barely ever going to be proving them. I'm just going to kind of ask you to take them for granted, which I know can be an annoying thing in math, and I'll leave resources below for people who are truly interested, but I just want to be honest about what you're going to get out of this video. What we are going to get out of this video is understanding how we can write the original SVM problem, which is written in this box here, equivalently in terms of what an optimization is called a dual problem. Now a dual problem, in its most easy definition, is one that it looks pretty different. For example, here's the dual problem, or rather here it is in its final form. And this looks kind of nothing like the original SVM problem. There looks like a different set of variables altogether. But interestingly enough, in optimization theory, we find that solving the dual actually solves the primal, and solving the primal solves the dual. And so we'll, we'll kind of make that connection as we go, but the point is that we're going to be able to express the SVM problem in a completely different form, and at the end we'll talk about why this alternate form is better for various reasons. So starting at the original formulation of the SVM, which I dropped the name primal just before, and in the optimization literature we call the original formulation the primal problem. Now this probably looks more familiar to you, especially if you watched the uh, previous videos we had on SVM, which will be linked below. We're trying to minimize one half norm of w squared. I think in that video it might have just been norm of w, but it's equivalent. And what this means is that we're trying to maximize the size of the margin that's separating the two classes. So this is the hard margin SVM problem. The reason we want to do that is we want the margin to be big enough so that the two classes are clearly separated by the best possible decision boundary. But we want to do that such that all of these conditions are met. Now notice I say all of these conditions. It looks like there's one condition here, but if you look a little bit more closely, there's i subscripts on the x's and y's, and therefore there are n conditions, one for each data point. And at an intuitive level, what these conditions are saying is that for all the data points, they either need to live on the margin, in which case this inequality would actually be equal to one, and we would call those the special name of support vectors, or they live outside the margin in which case this would be greater than one, and those would not be called support vectors. And so this is our original formulation of the SVM. Now what we want to do in a second is express this in a alternate formulation called the dual formulation. But the first thing we need to do is define a special function called the Lagrangian. You might have heard of the Lagrange multipliers or the Lagrangian before, but let me just go ahead and give you the Lagrangian for this specific problem. So the Lagrangian, written in this fancy L, is a function of W and B, just like we had up here, but also a function of alpha, which are n Lagrange multipliers, n being the number of data points we have, so every data point we have gets its own Lagrange multiplier alpha i. And this is equal to the objective function, which is 1 half w transpose w. That is exactly the same thing as this, because the norm of w squared is the same thing as w transpose w. It's a fact about vectors. And then we also tag on the subtraction of adding up all of these n constraints, where we modify it slightly so that the 1 is on the left-hand side, so we're comparing it against the number 0, and that's what you're seeing right here. And we multiply each of those constraints by the aforementioned Lagrange multipliers alpha i, and we sum all those together. Now this is, as I mentioned, one of those places where I'm not really going to spend the time proving to you why this is an important form um, in terms of this problem, but I just want you to understand that this is the Lagrangian formulation of this problem. And the main thing we need to get out of that is that it's a function of w and b, which define the uh, margin itself, and also alpha, which is this new variable is called Lagrange multipliers. And those will be more important as we progress through this video. Now we're actually ready to go ahead and define the equivalent problem, which is called the dual. So at a high level, what I want to get across is that this formulation, which I'll talk about in a second, is equivalent to the original, the primal formulation that we saw in the beginning of the video. By equivalent, I mean that solving one, so finding the best alphas, w's, and b's that solve this problem, will actually give you the solution to this original problem as well. Sounds like magic? Yes. And so that's why I put this asterisk here, is that it's not always going to be like this. There are 
uh, very certain constraints in terms of convexity and other things that have to be met um, in order for these actually to be equivalent problems. But again, this is one of those places where I will refer you to the resources in the uh, description of this video. So let's look at this and at least try to understand it. Let's try to get as much intuition as we can out of this video, even if it's not the full proofs of everything. So this is a max and a min. So whenever I see a max and a min, I at least get confused every time. So I have to talk myself through it. So let me just talk myself through it and then I'll be talking you through it in the process. So the outside thing is a maximization over all alpha i who are greater than or equal to zero. So we consider all possible settings of the alpha i Lagrange multipliers where they have to be non-negative. Now let's say we fix some setting for all the alpha i's. So whatever it is, as long as they're all bigger than or equal to zero, we just set them in some way. Now we enter a sub-problem. We enter this inside minimization problem where this alpha, so actually this alpha here, is fixed because we're only considering a certain setting for the alpha. And then we solve this other minimization problem where we're trying to minimize the Lagrangian, which we just defined, by going over different choices of W and B. And that's going to have some solution. And so we're going to have some minimum value for that Lagrangian. And that minimum value corresponds to the initial setting of alpha. Now we kind of backtrack and pick a different setting of alpha. And then we solve that corresponding minimization problem and get that minimum value. And the question is, which value of alphas do we uh, settle on in the end that's going to solve this problem? The ones who maximize the solution to this inner minimization problem. So I think it still might help to pause and rewind or think about it yourself, but at least make sure you kind of understand the interplay between the alphas, the w's, and b's. Now one thing we can say for sure, after explaining this max min problem, is that we need the stationarity constraints to be met. So no matter what alpha is, no matter what the best alpha is in the end, we need to solve this inner minimization problem, which is going to involve taking a partial derivative of L, the Lagrangian, with respect to W and with respect to B, and they both have to be equal to zero. That's the stationarity constraints. Partial derivatives must be equal to zero. Now, when we solve this first one, I won't actually solve it for you. It takes a little bit of algebra, which I didn't think was too worth the board space here. But if we solve that, we find that W, the best W for that setting of alphas, is equal to the sum from I equals one to N, so over all the data points, alpha i, y i, x i. A nice looking form, definitely, and we'll do some stuff with this form in a moment, but there's actually a very crucial, very interesting note we can make about the alphas, the Lagrange multipliers, right now. So remember back to our original SVM videos, even before the math, just talking about the intuition. We were saying that the only vectors, the only samples in our data that are contributing to the definition of the margin itself are the support vectors. And since w, is part of the definition of the margin itself. The only vectors in our data that are allowed to contribute to this definition of w can be the support vectors themselves. What does that mean? That means for any xi who are not support vectors at the end of the day, their alpha i must be equal to zero. So I'll write that here. And let me just walk you through that logic again in case it was unclear. If any of these alpha i's were non-zero for these non-support vectors, then they would have some kind of contribution according to this sum for w, and that's not allowed because we know that the only vectors in our problem that contribute to the definition of w are support vectors, and so only they are allowed to have non-zero alpha i's. This point's gonna be very important as we talk about the right-hand side of the board. But before we do that, we also have the second stationarity constraint and that um, when you solve that, it shows that the sum from i equals one to n of alpha i, y i is equal to zero, more compactly stated as alpha transpose y is equal to zero. So that's just the vector dot product formulation of this sum. So we can actually use these two facts and we can plug in, in the Lagrangian, everywhere you see a w, we can plug in this actual form for w. Now, why do we wanna do that? It seems like we're just making stuff more complicated. Our goal is to get this problem, which currently is in terms of W, B, and alpha. Let's see if we can't get it in terms of just alpha itself to actually simplify it. And part of that process would be plugging in this form for W, which here is only in terms of alpha. And when we plug that into the Lagrangian, the algebra gets a little complex. Again, not too worth the board space, but you can pretty easily work it out. And you'll find that the problem you get in the end Going from here to here, you still have that max on the outside, and the inside becomes the sum from i equals one to n of alpha i minus one half. This second sum is actually a double summation over all pair of i's and j's who both go from one to n of alpha i, alpha j, y i, uh, 
yj xi transpose xj. So on some level, it seems like it got more complex, but I'll show you why it's actually simpler in many cases. And we have the secondary constraint that alpha transpose y has to be equal to zero, according to this. Now, going back to that discussion about why is this actually simpler, note that we achieved our goal of having it be only defined in terms of alpha. There's no w's, there's no b's here, because those w's and b's can actually be recovered once we solve this in terms of alpha. We can use those alpha to get the best w's and b's according to this formula here. So the other reason that this is not as complex as it looks is because of this note we said. For all non-support vectors, alpha i is equal to zero. And if you think back to the SVM problem, usually there's not a lot of support vectors. There's a couple of support vectors which define the margin, and the rest of the data is not a support vectors, which means that most alpha i for any real world SVM problem is gonna be equal to zero. And therefore this double sum will have a ton of terms that just get canceled out to zero. And that's the simplification I'll make from going from this box down to this box. So one of the simplifications I make is that actually we're not pairing over all pairs of data points, we're actually pairing over or iterating over just all pair of support vectors. Because if we ever have a pair where even one of them is not a support vector, it's alpha i will be zero and it doesn't contribute at all. So that's the first big simplification. This sum is actually just a sum over pairs of support vectors. And for the exact same reason, this sum is actually just a sum over support vectors. The other thing you might have noted is I flipped the um, inside term, which I just took the negative of it. And this is kind of a personal choice, but I wanted this to be a minimization problem instead of a maximization problem. So I could have some symmetry between the primal and the dual. You don't have to do that. But um, since I did that, I did a minimization problem and I took the negative of the inside because maximizing a thing is minimizing its negative. Okay, so that's it. This is the dual formulation of the SVM problem. And this was the primal formulation of the SVM problem. The biggest takeaway from this video, even if you don't remember the math, is that uh, this, solving this primal problem is equivalent to finding the best alphas that solve this dual problem. And that's because of this dual primal uh, connection we have in optimization. And there's a lot of theory that I just didn't mention going into that, but you can take that for granted. And the final thing I'll say in this video is, why did I bother doing this video at all? Why did we go ahead and formulate the dual problem at all? Why is it helpful? There's two big reasons. The first one, you don't even have to think about kernels. It can just be helpful for this reason alone. So let's talk about that one first. Let's say we have a case of high dimensional data. What is high dimensional data? High dimensional data is data that has typically many more columns than it has rows. So typically when we think about a data set, we think about having lots of samples and a couple of variables for each of those samples, but there's tons of real world cases where it's actually the opposite, where your data set is more kind of long rectangular shaped. For example, think about image data. You might have like a thousand images, but each image can have an extremely high number of variables. Even if you think about something simple like, what's the value of each pixel? There's so many pixels in an image. There's more pixels in an image than you probably have images themselves if you have very high resolution images. So that's one example. Genetics data is another one. Um, each gene can have many, many variables associated to it, but you might only have a small number of genes. Either way, that means that P, which is the number of variables you have, is much bigger than N, which is the number of samples you have. Multiplying both sides of that equation by N, you get that NP would be much bigger than N squared. That's relevant because if you were using the original definition of the SVM problem, you'd have to be uh, constantly handling and working with a data set of size n times p, right? Because your xi's, there's n of them and each one has p dimensions, so you have to be working with a data set of n times p. It looks like you'd have to do the same thing in this dual formulation, but the key note, and this feeds into the kernel friendliness too, the key note is that x only shows up here in the form of inner products or dot products. So we only ever have to work with x in terms of xi transpose xj, which is the dot product of some vector with another vector in your data. And how many of those inner products are there? Well, you have n vectors, and you can take the inner product of them with any of the other n vectors. So you have n squared inner products of data, whereas you have np as the total size of your data. So if you have high dimensional data, it's actually going to be cheaper, less space and time intensive to work with the dual formulation who doesn't actually need your original data, it just needs the inner products between them. 
it's going to be cheaper to do that than work with your original formulation. So that's one case where this could be great. And um, the same fact I mentioned, the fact that we only care about the inner products, is going to be the exact fact that's going to be helpful for us in going to define kernels and the power of kernels. But I'll leave that whole discussion for the kernels video. So again, think of this video as a stepping stone. Make sure you generally understand what we did. The general idea is that we can express the SVM problem in a different way that has certain benefits. So if you learned something in this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. And we'll see you next time.